Smiley, please. So my name is Brittany Hernandez. I'll be your host for this lightning talk series. I am a lawyer and the founder of uh, Chromium Law and Chromium Kumai LLC, both of which focus on how innovations in tech can be used to solve human problems within the law and beyond. Today, document automation specialist Brendan DeBeer will share his thoughts on the topic, keep calm and build on how a programming mindset keeps me focused under pressure. Feel free to push your questions in the chat as you think of them, and Brendan will pick them up once he concludes. Um, after questions, I'll do a quick wrap up, after which you're free to stay on the call for an optional five minutes of networking. Um, and then uh, I'll invite four people to introduce themselves for one minute each. I'd now like to introduce today's speaker. Brendan DeBeer is an automation specialist at Documate. Documate is a no-code platform for building document automation and client-facing web applications for the law. Prior to starting at Documate, Brendan was a legal automation specialist with DocuZility. He's also an attorney of the High Courts of South Africa. He has experience automating and implementing complex doc document automation systems for in-house and external usage. And when he's not automating or reading, you can find him taking care of his house plants or hiking. Brendan, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Brittany. I'm just going to share my screen. Thank you for the lovely introduction. And it's nice to see everyone here today. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, you should be able to see it or anything. Just checking. Awesome. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about a topic, uh, keep calm and build on, how a programming mindset keeps me focused on the pressure. So I'm going to approach this in a staged approach. So firstly, I'm going to deal with what my idea of an attorney in the current stage of society should be like. And I'm going to tie that into with how that ties into my idea of a programming mindset for lawyers. So starting off, if my computer wants to listen, what is a new age lawyer? And like I put here, this is going to build up to what my idea of a programming mindset is. So the first thing I'm going to start off on here is called the Delta model. Now, the Delta model is an idea behind the lawyer competencies that are needed for a lawyer in the 21st century. This was a model that was developed in accordance with a lot of different institutions that have looked at this. And it's developed onwards from the previous model, two models. So the first model was an I model. In the I model, the most important thing for a lawyer was the law. You had to know the law. You needed to know how to apply the law. That was all you were concerned with. Following the 2008 financial crash, we moved towards the T model. With the T model, your understanding of the law was supplemented by technology and business processes. Since then, we've been moving towards what you see on your screen over here, the Delta model. Now, the Delta model, like I said, is the idea of what a lawyer needs in this day and age to meet current client demands. Our clients are expecting more for less. So what a lawyer needs these days is A, a thorough understanding of the law. That's what you would have learned in the I model. You also need an understanding of business and operations. That includes how to run the business and legal technology. And what the Delta model includes is personal effectiveness. That's your ability to deal with clients and different people in the industry. Now, the Delta model can be adapted to take into account different areas that exist in the legal work landscape these days. So this current model you see before you is a lawyer. But let's say a sole practitioner. You need to be good at everything. But if we move on to the next screen here, you can see that middle point can change to reflect different areas. So for example, a legal solutions architect, which also ties into automation specialists like myself, we are more focused on the business and operations side. We have a keen understanding of the law and our personal effectiveness needs to be enough that we can communicate the ideas and understand what clients want from us. Whereas if you were in my jurisdiction, they're called advocates, in other jurisdictions, they're called barristers, I presume brief writing expertise in the American jurisdiction is pretty similar, but your understanding of the law is better than the understanding of everything else because that's what you specialize in. And if you lead teams of lawyers, you'll have better personal effectiveness than everything else. So the Delta model adapts to show at certain areas of expertise in lawyers today. Now this pulls on to my next thing that I have here, which is rules as code. Now, if you're already a document user, you're actually already doing rules as code. Now, rules as code is a methodology for creating legislation in both human readable and machine readable formats. 
it's machine readable in the way that you can use it to connect to programs. Now, a lot of governments are spear lining this at the moment, most notably Canada, New Zealand, and France. They're enacting legislation that is connected to a computer, computer programs as well. This way, when you're building your legal applications, you're codifying the law into code. You, you're automating the law as you understand it. However, because the legislation draft has already made the rules machine readable, you could connect your programs to the API and automatically update your legal rules to apply your program rules. Now, as I put here on the, uh, the slide, it's not a specific tool per se. You could be doing document automation, it could be e-discovery, you could just be producing a informational pamphlet for someone. But it is a methodology of creating and applying rules in the legal age. And it also allows you, oh, sorry, the digital age, and also allows you to productivize your knowledge on written legal rules. So what I mean by that is you can codify your legal rules into a program. And that's effectively what you do with documented amongst other programs. However, with the current rules as a current concept, it really only works for things that are objective. You can't accurately showcase objective rules and rules as code very easily. Now, building on this concept is the concept of a recordian contract. Now, a recordian contract is mostly just involved in the blockchain sphere. If you've ever heard of a smart contract, it's similar to the concept of a recordian contract. But like you can see, here, a recordian contract is a program, effectively, that takes user input and it outputs a contract that's in code. So it's machine readable. It's data that you can reuse in programs, in databases, you, it's manageable, it's structured. And you get unstructured data, which is human readable. It's your legal document. With a program like Documate, uh, that's, this concept is easily showcased with Data Manager and your template that's produced at the end. It's also shown with the template that you're producing and the workflow that works with that template to populate it with variables. In the concept of blockchains, this would be a smart contract. You'd have your agreement and the smart contract enforcing it. Now, this all ties in to the actual topic of this, <laughs> of this uh, speech and just sort of giving a background. Now, the third concept is a second brain. Now, this is a concept by Tiago Forte in his book, Building a Second Brain. And this ties into my idea of what a programming mindset is, and that's really just reducing mental overhead. Because as a program, you're, as a programmer or a legal programmer, your main goal in producing legal automation projects or anything else is to reduce mental overhead. You want to automate the drudgery as much as possible so that you can focus on the task at hand. You can focus on dealing with your client. You can focus on this difficult legal problem that requires you to find a solution where there hasn't been a solution before. And keeping stuff like legal rules in your head or knowledge in your head is undesirable. You want to codify that output as much as possible. Now, I've included two quotes here that really resonate with this idea. The first one's from David Allen, which is from his book, Getting Things Done. And it's, your, your mind is for having ideas, not holding them. And secondly, from Tiago Forte, from his book, Holding a Second Brain, and that's we call someone who's not in control of their mind insane. What do we call someone who's not in control of their attention, which is the gateway to the mind? So if you're constantly holding all these things in your mind, and I mean, we're living in a fast-paced society. Your clients want this. Your program's not working. You're, you're getting emails everywhere. You can't keep track of everything and still do a solid job at whatever you're doing. So you need ways to compartmentalize these things so that you can reduce your overhead. So in the concept of building a second brain, you keep all your legal knowledge, all the knowledge that you have in a program. You keep it in a notebook. Now, I use two programs for this, Notion and Obsidian. It really just comes down to personal preference. Obsidian produces this really nice graph that interconnects the notes. Uh, it also allows you to keep your data offline while Notion. It's easier to use, but you're not exactly in control of your data. And I don't really recommend physical notebooks, but that is an option as well. Now, my idea of the programming mindset is one thing. It's reducing mental overhead, as I've mentioned before. And this is my idea of a, mental, a programming mindset for lawyers. Now, how do you reduce mental overhead and what is mental overhead? As I mentioned before, mental overhead is just 
keeping track of everything that's going on. If you've got a big meeting coming up, a big court case, anything, there's likely a lot of things that are going through your mind while you're dealing with that. A lot of times you can't focus on everything 100%, so you're stressing out, you have anxiety. It's not something that's easy to deal with. And how I deal with this and how I program as well is when I'm producing something, my entire concept of producing this thing is just to reduce my mental overhead. I want to offset my legal knowledge into a program. I want to automate it as much as possible. That way, you know, if I'm a lawyer in a law firm, someone comes to me with a problem, I know that legal knowledge is codified. I've got it in my head. I can always remember it. I mean, that's never going to go away. But I can offset some of the tasks to some other people in my firm, even if they don't have legal knowledge. I can reduce the fact that nothing's, not everything is riding on me. I've managed to reduce that into compared compartmentalized areas. Now, how do I develop this mindset? And this is where I turn into a motivational speaker, as opposed to someone just saying, keep calm. But uh, I keep checklists. So I create checklists for everything. Um, in terms of me automating, I'll have a development process. I use Trello for this because Notion isn't very good at task management, but I'll automate it along my development process. So for example, I'll have scoping with the client or whoever I'm getting instructions from. I'll have preparation of the documents. I'll have the development. I'll have review at each stage it goes through that. My program automatically annexes a checklist to it. From my side, I had to take the time to develop that checklist. I thought it through. I thought, you know, what exactly do I need to deal with every single time I go through an automation project? And my program automatically adds it to this. So I don't need to remember to add it every time. And then as I'm working through it, all I need to remember to do is check off that checklist. Now, checklists are great. They're useful and they're appreciated. They're very simple. But you reduce your errors and you make sure that you follow through for each step. Now, the second thing is collecting things. Uh, this builds into the building a second brain concept. But in terms of me as an automation specialist and as a lawyer, I keep notes of everything. Um, I keep it in a database format, but it's really whatever suits you. I like it as a database because I can use a SQL query to check that out to check something. Or in a database like Notion, I can search that and filter it. I can also tag it. So I'll collect useful code snippets for document. I'll also collect legal rules, cases regarding that, forms, and organize that. So I don't need to remember it. I, if I'm looking for something, I go to my notes, I search it, look through what I summarized about that specific topic a while back, and take it from there. The third step is learning and experimenting. In, because things are changing so fast, there's so many new things going on. You need to be constantly learning. And the only way to solidify that learning that you're doing, especially when it comes to technology, is experimenting. You need to understand how that code works. You need to understand how the program works. And the only way to do that is by building new things, experimenting, thinking of a concept like, can I automate complaints for litigation matters? How can I go about doing that? How do I build a you know, a clause bank that I can incorporate into contracts automatically so that I don't have to keep reusing the same contract with different variants of the same contract. These are all things to think about, experiment, try it out. Once you've tried it out, you know how to do it. You collect that knowledge that you have in a note and you solidify it into a checklist. So you work back like that. Then when you go forward, you've reduced the mental overhead to reproduce that and you can do it again very easily. Now, step four and step five are not necessarily related to step one to three, but I thought it'd be cool to include it because it does help develop the mindset. Now, there are always black swans. This refers to a book by Nassim Nicholas Taleb. Uh, he's not the most popular on Twitter, but he's, a, he's got interesting ideas. So the idea of a black swan is that in the past, before they discovered places like Australia and New Zealand and all those sorts of places, there were only white swans. Everything about a swan was tied to the idea of a white swan. It was inconceivable that there was a different colored swan. When they discovered Australia, there was a black swan, genetically identical to the swan, and it's just a black swan. No one expected it. No one, science couldn't explain it. It wasn't something anyone ever considered. 
But up until then, everything regarding that specific swan had been built up about the fact that this is a swan, this is the way it is, there's nothing else about it. So the idea of a black swan is that everything we know can change, everything we expect can change. As to use the cliche, you have to expect the unexpected. The way the legal world is now is not the way the legal world is going to be in 10 to 15 years' time. We can't predict what's going to happen with the knowledge we have today. All we can do is deal with everything we get given based on how we know to deal with it and take the unexpected as it comes along and try and deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis. And that's what I mean by there are always black swans. You're never going to know everything. So know what you can know and deal with it as you go along. And step five is just to have fun. I feel like I'm having a lot of fun lately by producing cool templates for document. And I'm very happy to be doing that. But I mean, you need to be able to have fun in everything you do. Just something, if you're not having fun, what's the point in developing anything or doing anything? The next step is how to apply the mindset. And these are really just, you can pick up any self output and get the same knowledge, but you need to have a goal. You need to work towards it. Don't let failure stop you. And if you're going to be developing legal programs and developing programming mindset, a lot of programming is really just bug testing. Uh, you're going to develop something and then you're going to test it for twice the time that it took you to develop it just to iron it out. And that's just part of the process. Then you can't let it get to you. You need to have it, you need to keep your end goal in mind and just keep going. And you need to test test and test everything that you do to make sure it's perfect. I've included this uh, rubber duck debugging and that's from a book actually. And what it refers to is uh, in the book, the programmer keeps a rubber duck on his desk. Whenever he runs into a problem that he, you know, he's got a coding problem, he needs to explain it and walk it through. He picks up the duck and talks to it in normal English. So he explains to this duck, how the code is supposed to work in normal English. And that's directly comparable to producing legal apps. You know, you run into a problem, how do I translate this legal rule into code? Well, think through it as simply as possible. Imagine you're explaining it to a duck like, or a small child. They need to understand that as you're going through that process, you'll understand, hang on, I know where my code's wrong. I can go back and fix that because you've got the gears moving in your brain. And the final step is working smart, not hard. Like instead of doing, you know, contract A for South Africa, contract B for England, contract C for the United States, which are exactly the same agreements, but the only thing that changes is, you know, jurisdictional clause, maybe some extra things there. Instead, just produce one contract and automate those specific parts. The concept behind this is if you're working too hard, you're doing it wrong. The programming mindset's all about making things easier, reducing the strain to do something and improving your life after it's done. If automating something still makes it as difficult as what it was in the past, you're just working a lot harder in a nicer packaged content. Now, this all ties into the actual idea of the talk and that's keeping calm under pressure using the programming mindset. So my, like I said before, my idea of the programming mindset is just reducing mental overhead and making my life easier. By doing that, I can keep calm. I know I can't expect everything. I, I can't like anticipate everything. I can't know everything. I know what I know. I've compartmentalized my thinking in such a way that, you know, my thoughts are in notebooks. My project management and my task management is handled by my project manager computer thing which I've automated to give me tasks. So I'll just load tasks in there. It gives it to me on a day-by-day -day basis. I don't need to remember that. My calendar remembers all my dates. I'm reducing mental overhead to the extent that, you know, if I've, if I've got a call where I've got to sell to a top-listed company or someone, massive law firms, I mean, I'm a dude in South Africa, what do I know? But by reducing my mental overhead, I can focus on my task at hand. I can say, listen, okay, the only thing I need to focus on for the next 45 minutes is handling this call or dealing with this problem because everything else is handled. That lets me keep calm because I'm just focused on the problem at hand. And I've freed my mental overhead that I can focus on the problem. 
Now this last page here is just about uh, appendixes or appendices. I actually spoke of a German guy today and he corrected me because <laughs> my first language is actually Afrikaans, so I just sometimes mess up the English of it. So this is just where I've gotten my information from the specific uh, presentation I've given. And the final page here is just a shout out to document and to say thank you for joining me here and listening to me talk today. And thank you so much, Brittany, for organizing these talks. They're amazing. I'm just going to hand this over to Brittany. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you so much, Brendan. That was awesome. I, I got to get a little preview of Brendan's talk the other day, and I was like, this is such great information. Um, we do have a few minutes for questions. If anyone would like to go ahead and either raise your hand or unmute. Um, and ask any questions. Um, I have one first really quick um, and you kind of mentioned uh, your a little bit of your tech stack. So you talked about Trello, you mentioned Obsidian and Notion. Could you go a little bit into um, sort of like, I use Trello for this, Notion for this, um, you know, whatever else for this? Yeah, sure. So I use Trello as my project management and personal task management tool. I like Trello because I can automate my tasks, which is something that most project management tools don't have. So I can build rules into it. And I prefer the visual layout of Canva and also allow me to keep in control. I can see at a glance where I am in the process. I don't need to dig to see the process. And I use Notion to store things. I use Notion to store knowledge. I just use Notion really as a knowledge base. Now I'm not a big fan of using multiple different programs because context switching reduces your productivity and your ability to stay focused on the task. So I prefer to use two to three programs and that's it. So from a personal development point of view, you know, I've got to develop in Microsoft Word because that's part of the job. So I'll have Microsoft Word as my development platform. Trello is my project management and task management platform and Notion is my knowledge base. That's all I use actually, along with email platforms. Thank you, that's helpful. Um, and then do we have any questions from anyone else today? If not, what I'm gonna do is um, move on to announcements. So um, let me just go ahead and share my screen next. And then if you think of questions as we go along, you can just put them in the chat. Uh, so let me share some announcements with you all. So um, before we wrap up, just want to let you know about four different things from Documate. So there is a new global search function for the data manager if you want to play around with that. Um, there's also an added webhooks function to send documents to other applications. Uh, and you can also now skip the final view page um, if you want to, if you don't want to have the, you know, the section where they can kind of edit, um, you can kind of make that to where it goes streamlined straight to the documents. And then very exciting to announce that, as Brendan mentioned earlier, um, there are now free workloads that work, workloads that you can use or um, document can actually port them to your document account and you can use them as a template and use them with your clients. Um, current freebies include NDAs and several common IRS forms. Uh, if you want to have them added to your document account, you just need to email hello at document.org and include the name of your workflow and so on. Um, you can also, uh, vote or recommend a workflow to be created and added. And then now you can also, um, there's gonna be a building, they're building a marketplace to help promote tools that people have built on Document and also allow lawyers to buy workflows from other lawyers, buy and sell through the marketplace. It's free and Document doesn't take a cut of any of the revenue. If you're interested in being part of the marketplace, you can email them at hello at document.org. Also, we'll be hosting these lightning talks on the last Thursday of each month. So the next one is going to be on Thursday, August 25th at the same time. Um, Document Success Manager and Certified Goals Automation Specialist, uh, Trisha Duffin will be discussing the topic, sharing the market share, how practice sharing among professionals will lead to exponential growth. Um, you can register for that lightning talk on the Eventbrite page by going to the Core Mam Law Eventbrite page. And we'll also send the link out in various emails afterwards. Um, so that concludes the main portion of our lightning talk today. We're going to transition into an optional five minutes of speed networking. So feel free to go if you need to, but if you'd like to stay, we'll stop the recording now and move on to speed networking. Um, Molly, would you mind uh, stopping the recording, please?